when I think about the internet, I really think about it as the ultimate open system. Because one of the great things about it is that you have a, a, an architecture group, the IETF, you have the W3C, and everything they do is in the open. All of their meetings, all of their records, uh, people are able to join on a meritocracy basis. So if you know what you're talking about and you can contribute, you're welcome. Uh, and so you see what's going on. And you see this across uh, aspect of other pieces of the internet. The, the ICANN, uh, you can run for office. You can be, should you be sufficiently masochistic, you can join the ICANN board or at least run for office there. So there's a, a great deal of openness around the, the internet. Uh, and of course, we've seen people take uh, great advantage of it over, over time. So, uh, we also have seen that there are numerous implementations of web infrastructure, uh, things like uh, HTTP servers. Now, Apache happens to have about 60% of the market share for uh, that HTTP browser, but other people have come along and some that you and I haven't heard of and, and built their, their own versions of this, uh, even lighter weight things or specialized things. Now, the other thing that's really important about the internet as a whole is that it's disrupted many, many different disciplines and different vendors who have used the internet to do so. So we can go way back. I mean, the first web browser, Mosaic, the uh, first one to get significant use, uh, you know, came along in, in the uh, early 1990s, 1994, I think. And I, re I remember using it then and thinking, how cool was this? And of course, there was very little there, and it was mostly an occasional picture, but mostly text. Uh, but again, it was open and free to, to use and was then uh, supplanted by things like uh, Netscape Navigator. And we'll come back and talk about the disruption that, that was caused there. One of the other interesting things here, uh, when you think about the internet as a whole, the, the openness of it has given plenty of opportunity for people to create free, open source, freely downloadable and freely usable software. And it also has hit a couple of other categories, one of which is the, uh, the ability to run tools and run applications inside your browser, uh, and also the ability to uh, create for pay products, right? So uh, there are a variety of things that people charge you money for and they run on the internet or they connect pieces and parts. But if we look around and, and think back for ourselves at how we used to do things, you remember software stores? Right? So those are pretty rare these days. If you, uh, if you go into Fry's, which is something I, I try never to do, but if you go in there, you'll see that they actually have a little bit of packaged software. Most of it, I think, has to do with viruses. but. Uh, but it's very unusual now to find packaged software store. Apple used the internet to disrupt several different disciplines, right? So video and uh, music and books. And now we're seeing education be significantly affected by this. The idea that uh, in, in the near future, anybody can watch this video over the internet. All those kinds of things are really disruptive to the way we've, we've done things. Even this week, uh, as you looked at the television networks announcing their uh, ratings for the, for the season that's just ending, or you look at their plans for next year, all of them are talking about the fact that traditional viewing of network television is going away. It's not going to go away entirely, but in fact, young people today don't have the network TV viewing habit that most of us grew up with. 
and the fact that most of the programs they want to see are available one way or another uh, over the internet and programs that we watched when we were kids are now available for batch viewing. Now, I, I never really caught on to this notion of binge viewing, but, you know, it's there. So, again, we can see one industry after another, one traditional means of, of working or living completely uh, transformed by uh, this. We've seen the Internet have a huge influence on politics, uh, on the way campaigns are run, on the way marketing is done. If you've been in a marketing role in a company, uh, you know that um, 15 or 20 years ago, you used to send stuff out. You used to advertise in print. People don't do that anymore, hardly. Right? What they do is try to come up with techniques to help you find them. Right, through search algorithms, through uh, those kinds of things. And then you go to their site and then they track you. And then, uh, but it's a whole different way of, of doing business. So one thing after another, you'll see that the internet has changed the way we live and changed the way that we work. One, one other piece of it that it's, I think is really uh, worth mentioning is the whole social network aspect of the internet. I had an experience a couple of years ago where my elementary school, the school that I went to for one semester in eighth grade, was having a reunion. And they found me. I'm not on Facebook, but they found me. And, you know, what's the likelihood of that happening 15 or 20 years ago? Zero, right? So, the fact that we can stay connected with people that uh, we haven't seen in ages and, you know, an occasional message here or there. So the Internet has also had this disruptive effect on personal relationships. And I don't know about you, but hardly a day goes by when I don't get some message inviting me to connect to somebody on LinkedIn or uh, one or another of these social networks. Now, I wanted to focus this evening on the software industry, but I wanted to make sure that we had set that context because it has a really significant impact in a lot of ways. We're going to talk mostly about how software gets developed now and the kinds of applications that are developed. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how software gets supported, marketed, and sold. Uh, but um, uh, I want to keep the things we talked about already in context because it affects the way that software vendors communicate with their users, the way that they distribute their products, all the other kinds of things that they do. So, uh, back in the day, software was free. Really? Well, okay, public domain software paid for by you. American tax dollars, uh, you could get your hands on it. But once you got your hands on it, it probably wasn't useful because there were so many different computers and, they, and many of the programs that were written were intended to run on raw hardware or they had assembly code in them that ran only on a particular kind of machine. And at that time, there were so many different kinds of machines that you, were, you know, here's this code. Well, okay, what am I going to do with that? Uh, now, of course, in 1964, System 360 came along, and one of the marketing points that IBM made at the time was that, hey, if you have small computing needs or if you have big computing needs, you can use some machine in this compatible set of fam this compa compatible family of computers. And uh, out of that, vendors emerged, third parties who said, you know, we can build a product that we can sell to run on this machine. And ADR, I think, was the first company to um, offer commercial software for sale. Martin Getz was the founder and CEO of that. And there were also some products that were made by the uh, vendors of various hardware devices, General Electric and IBM and Honeywell and, and some of the others, that 
they unbundled from the hardware and they sold it to you independently. So the emergence of the software industry at that time uh, started things out. And if you bought software at that time, you knew that you would get a magnetic tape. Right? Remember those? But as we think about the, uh, the commercial side of things, you have enterprise software, right? Oracle databases and SAP and the like, those kinds of things. You have consumer software, office automation, and so on. Games came into there. Uh, and then you also had this category of free and public domain software, things that uh, you could download and use at no charge. Uh, people called it shareware, and they asked you to voluntarily pay some modest sum of money. Uh, and there are quite a few products that people use today that originated as shareware. Uh, WinZip is one of them that uh, people may be quite familiar with. So those categories, and I split them because uh, they tended to be sold differently. Enterprise software had a big enough price tag that you would have a, a company's own direct sales representative call on the customer. And the next level, consumer software, that's what the software stores sold for the most part. And then the free and open source software, you could perhaps send a message to the developer and they would send you a disk, a floppy disk or something that you could use on your machine. Eventually, you were able to download it, but in the earlier stages, uh, that was uh, not, not an option in general. So we have an enterprise software product. You know, it costs money to have a salesperson make a sales call. Right? Salespeople are often uh, so expensive in terms of the uh, cost of operating a software business that people joked about it. That is, uh, if you had a $20,000 product, let's say, or, and you sold a couple of licenses, it would cost you thousands of dollars to complete the sale. And in fact, you would really be paying the vendor to sell it to you. I mean, it's just how the numbers worked out. It was, it was, it was pretty funny in, in some respects. But uh, the process was long. You'd go and make presentations, you'd negotiate a contract, you'd have a trial, all this stuff would drag on for uh, six months or a year, a spending cycle. And if you had something really complicated like SAP's uh, products, it would come with some lengthy period of customization and adaptation to a particular company and its environment. And, you know, that turned out to be a pretty complicated deal. Consumer products, uh, I think probably most of us have been around and gone, remember computer stores and gone in and bought one product or another. Uh, and uh, so you got the physical media. Eventually, you were able to buy things online and download them. Now, as the internet emerged starting in the 90s, yes, I know I've had email since 1974, but that doesn't really uh, give you the opportunities of the disruption that the internet in general gave you. Uh, so uh, you know, in the internet era, we've seen the growth of hosted applications. Uh, and we all do this routinely, right? Yahoo started in 1994. You went to their website, you did a search. Uh, that was the kind of thing that was new, that the internet enabled that you couldn't really easily do before. Gopher really didn't work uh, for that kind of stuff. Uh, we see today all kinds of cloud-based applications where uh, instead of uh, hosting things on some server that you can identify uh, that's connected to the internet, the cloud-based applications, they're out there somewhere. Right? So many of the startups that we see today use Amazon Web Services or Rackspace or one or another uh, cloud hosting service. Uh, and in general, we use that. Now, there are some technical and political problems with it. Uh, if you happen to be in Europe, the idea that the 
programs and data that you're accessing aren't in Europe. That's a big problem in terms of their laws. Uh, and, and the cloud hosting providers have uh, done their own things to, to uh, accommodate that requirement. We, in addition to these kinds of cloud and, and software as a service based products, we also see that the ways of selling software are different. So there's a lot of software today that comes with no charge. I mean, you think about, you use Google, you use Yahoo, you use many other uh, online services, and you don't pay to use them. Right? Because they're supported by advertising, or they're supported in, in a variety of other ways. Uh, so ad-supported software is something that we didn't see when we went into a store and stuck a disk, you know, bought a disk and stuck it in our, um, in our machines. We see uh, connected applications and games, things like World of Warcraft, with many thousands of people at any given moment. Skype has, if you look on any, you know, when you log in, it's like more than a million people using it at any given time uh, because you know it's around the world somewhere somebody is up and on is online making these uh, having these converse conversations and of course we see mobile applications uh, by by the latest count there are more than a million applications if you count iOS and Android and Windows Phone and Blackberry uh, and you know, a couple of minor other ones, uh, a million applications. And the pricing has changed. It's none of this $50,000 for the enterprise software or $99 for the consumer software. It's 99 cents. And you're very hard pressed to find uh, a mobile application that sells for more than $10. Now, some of these mobile applications have in-app purchases where you can buy uh, various things. You can spend a lot of money doing that, but, but getting the, the basic application, it's so inexpensive that it has to change the way that you develop the software. It has to change the way that you interact with customers completely. Right? So if you have a 99-cent piece of software, how much money can you afford to spend on advertising? really not very much. Right? Even Rovio with Angry Birds doesn't spend very much money in advertising and they have a bunch of different products and tchotchkes of various sorts and, uh, and, and they make quite a lot of money from, from their uh, various uh, apps and advertising connected to it. So, and last but not least is free and open source software. As I said before, Free software has been around for quite a while, but one of the things that's happened uh, and has been accelerated by the move to cloud computing and the move to the internet and the economic downturn is that suddenly open source software looks pretty good. All of the uh, data that people have collected show that it's of the, the best open source products, the ones that have commercial support, they're of comparable quality, if not superior, to commercial apps that have been out there. They are uh, easily available. You can try them for an indefinite period of time at no charge. Uh, so you don't have the situation that we all have faced where you lay out some significant sum of money for software licenses and gee, a year later that turns out not to be what you really needed. And so that ends up on the shelf and your money is, you know, gone, uh, with open source software, you can, in fact, uh, use it to your heart's content indefinitely. And one of the other things that's really great about it is that if you're a startup, think about what it costs you to get started today versus what it costs you to get started 20 years ago. So 20 years ago, you needed to have you know, physical space, you needed to have machines, maybe a server, you needed to have an internet connection that you know was sufficiently fast to serve your customers. You needed a bunch of things. Today, not so much, because you can go to uh, 
use open source software. The development tools that we sold for real money not so long ago, you know, nobody pays for development tools hardly. Other than that, you know, Eclipse uh, with the Android toolkit, Xcode, all these kinds of things that people are using to build large numbers of applications, they're free. And the cost of distribution has come down because you can make them available for download. You can use uh, cloud services like Git and uh, SourceForge and CloudForge and things like that to uh, collaborate among people. All these kinds of things have tremendously uh, dropped the cost of doing software development so that you can, in fact, offer your software for 99 cents. Not that you're going to make a lot of money on it, but still you can do that. So the, the types of software have really uh, changed things a lot. Now, so we've got such different systems. Of course, we build them differently. The tools and the technologies are different. The, you know, some years ago when you started looking for a, uh, a simulator or an emulator for a mobile phone because you were going to build a mobile app, you know, good luck with that. Right? There were a couple. And there were a couple emula emulators for mobile browsers. But having built mobile applications in the year 2000 in the building next to us, uh, now, I can tell you there wasn't much out there. I had this little lab and we had all these little mobile devices and we flew off to places in the world where mobile service actually existed and got devices and tested these things out. Uh, and it was a pain. Today, you can download um, uh, Accelerator's Titanium and you can do cross-platform development. You can do things that are native to the emulated device. Uh, you can do things that are HTML5, so that they're going to run you know, on the server. And you can do it all there on your, your laptop. Uh, I think if you were to scrounge around on my machine, you'd see that I've got Eclipse, I've got uh, Accelerator, I've got uh, an account for uh, CloudForge, I've got so I have Xcode. Uh, all these things that you know, let me use an inexpensive machine to do software development. So that's really uh, quite a change. Now, there are some difficult things to deal with. Uh, one of them is that applications today, I have more about this later, but applications today aren't monolithic the way that they were at some point. We went from a period where we built monolithic applications to periods where we built, built client-server applications, to building MVC-styled applications where we separated the user interface from the process from the database backend. But today, we do even more. We may use that same kind of architecture, but we don't write our own e-commerce software. We don't write uh, other kinds of services that many of the uh, applications use. And so, we have the code that we've written or inherited or uh, reused, uh, plus a lot of black box code that provides certain services to us. Uh, and so, again, you're going at things in, in rather a different way. If you're testing, it really has a big impact on you because you can't replicate your problems the way that you can when you have everything on your own server running an operating system that you know and using services that are local to you. There you can usually reproduce your problem. But, but in the wild west of the internet, uh, it's very, very difficult indeed because, you know, you get some kind of communication spasm and something fails uh, and you're out of luck. So one of the things we see is that software engineering for the web is uh, significantly different from s traditional kinds of software engineering. And one of the uh, features that, come, that, that pushes that is the move from traditional kinds of software development processes to more agile approaches, to uh, 
to Scrum and to lean software development because these things focus on addressing user needs, being in contact with users, uh, being uh, focused on a particular feature and getting that out, releasing early and releasing often, all those kinds of things completely change the software development process. Um, you know, we've got a lot of differences. The languages that we use are, are different. Uh, uh, certainly the, uh, the Android world uses Java, but a lot of the other uh, kinds of application development use Python, and it uses PHP, and it uses uh, scripting languages. Uh, if you uh, look at the amount of JavaScript code in many of these applications, the stuff is totally ugly and, and not, not easily maintainable. But there it is, because you have front-end tools that will jo generate that JavaScript for you. So you're working at a different level of abstraction. And then that code comes out the back end, and it more or less runs on all the different uh, browsers. So uh, let's go ahead just in the interest of time. We can spend a, a long time at this. Um, <clears throat> so one of the questions that comes up a lot is, are there processes for software engineering now, or does everybody just hack away? Well, granted, there's a fair amount of hacking, and every time I hear that somebody is holding a hackathon, you know, for people to come in and write as much code as they can, as quickly as they can, I kind of uh, cringe a little bit about that. But, uh, but if you're going to build the, uh, something that other people are going to use, you have to do a little bit better than that. You, in fact, have to do more than rudimentary version control or configuration management that you know what you're releasing and what you're testing. And you uh, want to be able to have uh, a staging server so that you can kind of put everything together in addition to your development device and a deployment environment. And the deployment environment may be somewhere out there in the world that you don't know about, which is the same for your staging environment where you're, where you're testing things. We all know that many of the leading uh, vendors uh, and services use A-B testing, so they'll take uh, some segment of their servers and they'll put new software there and try it out and compare it with the current version that's, that's being used. And if it goes reasonably well for a fair amount of time, they'll switch everybody over and all those kinds of changes in the way that, that things are going on. So there are, there are certain process steps that are used by organizations that are building mobile and internet and cloud applications that are different from what we did uh, a long time ago. Is there a process? Yes and no. If you were to go look at the SCI CMMI and it shows you 22 key process areas, and it's a horrendous list, but you can find that list online. And now you ask yourself the question, if I'm a three-person startup, how many of those processes are relevant to my life? And you're going to come up maybe with two. Okay, requirements management and configuration management. Now, the other 20, you know, they're way down the road. Uh, so, so development processes have changed. QA has changed. Release early, release often. So I was using this uh, PDF a tool called Skim. And one of the things I did was I went to their site and I looked at their development history. And this was about a year ago. Uh, they, had not, they had just barely reached 1.0 and they had re made 36 releases of the software. 36. Well, all right. I don't know how many there are now, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if it was about 50. I should have gone and checked. Now, in the old days, it was expensive to deliver software to customers. You had to physically put it on a disk or a tape or something, and you had to pay postage and ship it out, and the customer had to install it and all those things, right? Today, the burden is on the user. 
oh, here's this new version. Would you like me to download it and install it for you? Or would you like to download it and then install it yourself? And you can say yes or no. But if uh, there, there are reasons for, for both responses. So it's a very different thing. When did that happen? Well, it happened in about 1996. Uh, because Netscape had the brilliant insight that they could release early and release often, and they could release buggy software. Because the penalty for doing so had dropped. Before that, when you had to send something out to customers, it cost you money to deliver the new version. But when you could download something over the internet, then they could shift the burden to the user and say, oh, by the way, gee, we're sorry about this bug in the 4.1 version. Here's 4.1.1 that fixes that bug and download it. And so there were, in fact, 15 releases of Netscape 4, going up to 4.7, I think, was the last of them. Uh, so you know, again, that's a shift where they've placed the burden on the user. Now, back at that time, a lot of people were dealing with relatively slow internet connections and unreliable connections and limits on uh, capacity uh, where you know, it was a burden to download things. But today, certainly in developed countries, even in the United States, uh, it's possible to, you know, to do that without too much pain, uh, at least on computers where there's not a, a data cap. In the interest of time. So this kind of uh, carries forward. If you have a website, you know, it used to be that uh, the software is out there with your customer, they're using it, you're able to work independently on creating your next version. If there's some critical issue, then you can patch it and create a new version and send that out. Uh, but we don't have that luxury anymore. When these sites go down for an hour, they make the headlines. Right? And we read CNET and ZDNet and Mashable and Yahoo and all these other sites that are completely tuned into the current state of the world. And when the site crashes, hundreds of people immediately tweet it. Right? And so the expectations that people have for software to work and the expectations that they have for sites to be up are unrealistic, actually. But they are what they are. And so if you're a development organization, you have to be prepared to deal with that. Uh, and it's a two-way street. You know, when Amazon is down, it costs them money. When all these other companies went down because Amazon Web Services, one of their sites had trouble, but in Virginia, I think, uh, and a bunch of startups lost their access, they looked bad, and Amazon in turn looked bad. So, so we've now reached this uh, level of expectation that these uh, sites and these applications are going to work 24 by 7, whatever. So even the switch over between your staging environment and your deployment environment uh, becomes uh, an issue. And you can try to do it in the middle of the night on a weekend, but in fact there are people awake at all hours of the day and night somewhere in the world. Uh, so uh, all of these things come, come into play. Uh, so when we look at you know, these, uh, today's uh, modern web apps, what are the things that really uh, make a difference, that make websites successful? One, of course, is usability. We've all gone to websites that are completely impenetrable, right? that um, uh, you can't navigate your way around, that the menus are unclear, that something doesn't work. And do you know how long the average person stays on that site? Eight seconds. Eight seconds. Now, you might say that people are impatient, and you would be right. 
So uh, sometimes it's a site you know well, and you know it's having a problem. I mean, I'm a heavy user of Flickr, and there are times when I go there and the page doesn't load. What do I do? I go away and I come back in 20 minutes, and it's working okay. But most of the time, even Flickr comes up and it says, "Oops, we're having problems right now. Please try again in a moment." So more and more sites recognize that they've got to be immediately responsive because they don't want to lose you. Uh, so when you look at successful websites, they change the content frequently. They are built on a content management system that delivers new feeds and new content <laughs> regularly. Uh, they uh, provide ways for people on the site to communicate with one another, whether it's discussion boards or comments on an article or uh, ways to connect to other people. All these things are there so that, you know, we used to do user group meetings for, for our product. And user group meetings still exist. Salesforce.com takes over San Francisco with Dreamforce. They had like 90,000 people there last year. Uh, Oracle takes over downtown San Francisco with uh, uh, annual open, open world conference. They had like 50,000 people there. But apart from that, I mean, a lot of people can't make the trip for whatever reason, money, distance, time, commitments, elsewhere, what have you. Uh, so companies and vendors are trying to build communities around their products. And they do this as part of the offering on their products. So you can go to a vendor's site and interact with the support organization, interact with other users, post questions and comments. And if I post, post a question and some other user answers the question and does so correctly, that's good for me because I get a rapid response. And it's good for the company because that's one more thing that the support engineer doesn't have to do, so they don't need so many. But it, so all of these things are going on in these successful web applications. And of course, we know about personalization. Uh, almost every site you go to these days asks you to create a profile, right? Because they want to know about you. They want to serve the best content to you. They want to be able to uh, make that of information available, ideally anonymously, to the people who advertise on their site so that they can send you the uh, advertising that is perhaps most appropriate, at least what they think, uh, for you. And of course, uh, fast, reliable, easy to use goes without saying. You know, we need a team of people with different sets of skills. So. Yeah, you know, there's no there's no such thing here as your generic programmer. You've got people who have front end user interface design skills. You have people who know how to deal with scalability and dynamic allocation of resources. You have people who know how to architect the back end and uh, to deal with the data management aspects of it and design the database properly. So it's really a matter of pulling a team of people together with a uh, a set of skills that leads you to the very best sites. Uh, it leads you to things that, that perform well. Um, now, in many of these cases, you want to use existing architectures and frameworks. There are a lot of uh, companies that are in the business of providing a platform. So, for example, in 1999, Salesforce.com came along with their CRM application. And you know, many people chose to use that as, as a software, as a service application. About five years ago, Salesforce.com decided to reveal, expose, a platform called Force.com. And they've subsequently revealed Data.com. And the idea is that you can build your own application on top of that. So all that infrastructure is already there, all the scalability, all the interfaces, the database, what have you, connection to the uh, customer lists. And so now you can use all that infrastructure to build a new app relatively quickly. So that in integration architecture and framework is uh, an important piece of this. 
just a couple more slides and then we'll, uh, we'll break. I said earlier that uh, you know, most of these websites and applications are dependent on third-party software. And here's a list of the kinds of things that most people will go out and use a third party for. So content caching, companies like Akamai you know, store images in different parts around the world and they distribute them down to uh, the machine uh, you know, at, at runtime when you look for it. Order fulfillment, visitor tracking. Uh, so uh, Square today, which makes these um, uh, point of sale uh, devices, you know, they've now expanded what they offer. So why should I do my own e-commerce uh, tool? They provide me with the APIs that let me use their tool, or is the same is true for PayPal, the same is true for other payment services like Visa and MasterCard. Uh, you know, I'm not going to write that stuff myself. Why would I do that? What I want to do is function on the higher level functionality. Email processing, ad servers. And you see, you see this all the time if you keep track of the sites that you visit, that you actually hit when you're visiting some site. You look down there in the window and it says, oh, it's you know, caching this from here. It's going out there and, and using that. Let's just take a couple of minutes uh, to talk about sales and marketing. Because I, I assume most of the people here come from a technical background and have, you know, have done the engineering and know about the processes. But as I suggested earlier, the way that we design and develop uh, applications has changed, but the way we sell them has changed drastically, right? particularly for consumer level applications. Uh, advertising for consumer applications is pretty much gone. You know, maybe there are search terms on the web, but, but you don't see print advertising. How many of you get you know, print computer magazines? Remember PC World and Byte Magazine and I think the, I don't think they print Computer World anymore. Maybe they do. Uh, but, you know, a Digital World. I mean, there are dozens of these things that, that we used to get, and, and they existed because hardware and software vendors spent money to put ads in them, uh, and that doesn't happen anymore. So, all the, uh, the limited advertising you'll see is on the web, but more commonly what you want to do is search engine optimization. So somebody looks for design, software design, some vendor will buy that phrase and an ad will pop up in response which will uh, hopefully uh, get people to click through and see what the software, what, what vendor is, is um, hoping that you will click on software design. So we've gone from a lot of this outbound marketing to uh, to inbound marketing. And uh, if you're interested in more about inbound marketing, there's a website called HubSpot. Uh, there's also a vendor of small to medium business marketing tools called Marketo. They're about to go public, I think, but it's M-A-R-K-E-T-O. I don't have any uh, financial connection to them at all, but they have a good paper, uh, a good booklet that you can get that describes how all this inbound marketing works. Uh, so what we used to do was spend a lot of money to advertise to people and the percentage of people who might be interested in what we were advertising was about yay big. You, know, you put an ad in Software Magazine and 100,000 people read it and maybe only a couple hundred of them are interested in software design tools, let's say. So you've you know, spent the money to advertise to 100,000 people, but you'd really like to be marketing just to those few hundred. Uh, so that's what we have today, is inward bound marketing. So we find people through social media, we tweet to them, we track site visitors. Uh, so when you go to some uh, website that you've heard about, maybe you read about them on TechCrunch, you go to the site, now you sign up, you put yourself on the mailing list. They score you. They know what you've done. If you've downloaded the software, they've got your email address. You'll hear from them. Trust me. Uh, because they know that you're interested. Okay. 
So you are a high probability compared to, you know, the people, you know, people used to buy the mailing list for Software Magazine and send them junk in the mail. Well, that's, you know, expensive as well as being unproductive. Even in the good days, if you got a 1.5% response rate, you were golden. Okay. And today, you know, when you look at the click-through rates for ads or you look at the response to, to advertising cards, it's an order of magnitude less than that. So it just doesn't pay at all. Most of us certainly here in, in the Bay Area have gone through several careers and lots of different companies and, uh, and lived through many of the changes that we've talked about. So, uh, you know, it would be, in 1982 I wrote a paper about the future of programming and I thought that I kind of had a fairly good clue of what might happen. And it's not embarrassingly bad. I went back and read it not too long ago. It's wrong, but it's not embarrassing. Uh, uh, and if I tried to do the same thing today, you know, we'd talk about the Internet of Things, we'd talk about smart devices, we'd talk about uh, communications, lack of privacy, some of these things that are kind of obvious. Uh, but, um, but there's going to be more. The, the speed of computing is going to continue to drive things. The decreasing cost of storage is going to make a lot of sophisticated analysis possible that hasn't been possible until now. And what will come out of that, I think, um, is going to be real interesting. And uh, I'm looking forward to sticking around and seeing what happens. So uh, thanks all for coming. Thanks for your time. And I'll be glad to stick around and answer some questions. <laughs>